In today's video, we are going to be having a look at all the diagrams you need to know for your IGCSE 0455 economics exam. So without further ado, let's get into the video. Let's start off with the PPC curve. The production possibility curve diagram shows the maximum combination of any two categories of goods and services that can be produced in an economy at any point in time. So essentially, it just shows the productive capacity of the economy. So now let's have a look at the different points on the PPC curve. We start off with point A. Point A shows all the resources are dedicated to the production of wood and furniture, and hence we are not producing any olive oil because it is on the extreme left of the PPC curve. At point B, all the resources are dedicated to the production of olive oil, which means we are not producing any wooden furniture, but only producing olive oil. At point C, W1 tons of wooden furniture is produced along with O1 liters of olive oil. And at point D, W2 tons of wooden furniture and O2 liters of olive oil is produced. We have two other points, point E and point F. At point E, this point is beyond the production possibility curve, which means that we don't have the resources required to make those certain goods, and hence it is beyond the production possibility curve. We call this point unattainable. Point F is a point which is within the production capacity in the economy. So this means that we can produce both olive oil and wooden furniture without any opportunity cost because we are not using all the resources. Hence, I can decide to produce any of them without any opportunity cost. We know that opportunity cost is basically the good that's foregone. But in this case, we are not foregoing any good. Hence, there is no opportunity cost. Let's move on to the movements along the PPC curve. The movements along the PPC curve simply means when we move from producing at one certain point to another certain point, there will be a movement in the curve. A movement along this PPC will result to an opportunity cost. This means that we will lose out of one certain product because we are producing more of one product than the other. In this figure, you can see a movement along the PPC from point X to point Y, which means we are producing more of consumer goods than producer goods, but at an expense of fewer producer goods. We can have outward shift and inward shifts. What are the causes of outward shifts? One being an increase in the labor force by encouraging birth and immigration, new technology and production methods, discovery of new resources, such as oil fields, increased labor productivity due to training or education. What are now the causes of the inward shift? One being natural disasters, example floods and earthquakes, reduction in labor due to emigration and death of population, depletion of resources, which basically means resources are being used, and finally, slow replacements of old machineries and reduced investments in new technology, which basically means production capacity will reduce because of lack of good machines. Now let's have a look at a past paper question on the PPC curve. Here it says, analyze using a production possibility curve, PPC, diagram, and the beneficial effects for a country of the growth of its small and medium-sized firms. So as you can see, it is six marks. Therefore, you get four marks for the diagram and two marks for a small explanation about the diagram. So to draw this diagram, first you have to label the axis correctly and this will always give you one mark. The next one, you will have two curves drawn and this will be an outward shift as when there are more firms, that means that the labor capacity or the labor productivity will increase and hence there will be more outputs of goods and services, hence it will be an outward shift. So basically, you have to show an outward shift and then you put an arrow to show the shift because that will give you one mark. Finally, to get the other two marks, you can simply just say that the growth of these small and medium sized firms lead to an increase in the number of firms in the economy. That can give you one mark. And then you can say that this will lead to more productivity in the economy, hence can cause economic growth, which will therefore lead to your six marks. Now let's move on to the demand and supply curves. In order to understand these curves, you first need to understand what demand and supply is. Let's start off by defining what demand is. Demand is simply refers to the willingness and the ability of customers to pay a given price to buy a good or service. This sometimes is referred to as effective demand. We also need to know the law of demand because we will be using it to construct the graph. 
the law of demand simply states that an increase in the price would lead to a fall in demand and vice versa. Now, let's define supply and then move on to the graphs for each of the following. Supply is simply the ability and willingness of firms to provide goods and services at a given price level. So in terms of supply, we're looking at firms, but in demand, we're looking at consumers. The law of supply simply states that a rise in a price would lead to more supply and a fall in price would lead to less supply. Keeping that in mind, let's have a look at the two different graphs and the shifts in both of them. The demand curve shows us the relationship between price and quantity demanded. To show the movements along the demand curve, we have to look at it in terms of price. When there's a rise in the price, there will be a contraction in demand. But when there's a fall in price, there will be an extension. In this figure, as you can see the three points, A, B and C, a rise in the price would mean it would move from B to A. This will show a contraction. And on the other hand, when it moves from B to C, it will be an extension. This is movement along the demand curve. Now let's have a look at the shift in demand curve. And remember, the movement along the demand curve only happens when there is a change in price, but the factors of demand remain constant. A demand curve can either shift to the right or shift to the left. When it shifts to the right, this is caused by an increase in demand due to the other factors without a change in price. And a shift to the left is caused by a decrease in demand due to the other factors without the change in price. Whenever we're dealing with the shift to the right or the shift to the left, we're looking at the factors that affect demand and not price. When it is price, then we know it is extension or contraction. But when we're dealing with factors that affect demand, we're having a look at either shift to the right or shift to the left. To know the factors that affect demand, you can watch my previous videos because that is not the main objective of today's video. Let's have a look at the supply curve. When having a look at the movement along the supply curve, we have again the extension and the contraction. When there is a fall in price, this would lead to a contraction. And when there is a rise in price, this will lead to an extension. When having a look at the shift to the right and shift to the left, an increase in supply will lead to a shift to the right, while a decrease in supply will lead to a shift to the left. Let's have a look at a past paper question on demand and supply diagrams now. It says here, draw a demand and supply diagram to show the effects of a decrease in the cost of production on market for cars. So in here, we have to draw basically a demand and supply diagram. So when it says demand and supply diagram, we have to include both the demand curve and the supply curve. But in this case, we are saying a decrease in the cost of production. So when there is a decrease in the cost of production, that means that I can have increase in supply because I will have more profit hence there will be a shift to the right. So in this diagram we have to basically show a shift to the right, we have to basically label the axis which will give you one point, you have to draw both demand and supply curves and you have to label them. You then show the supply curve which will shift to the right and finally you can draw the equilibriums which will give you the other mark which will give you the four marks consisted in this question. Let's now have a look at equilibrium. Market equilibrium basically refers to the position where the demand of for a product is equal to the supply of that product. At this point, an equilibrium price, which is also known as market clearing price, is established. Here is the diagram for market equilibrium. As you can see, the supply diagram and the demand diagram meet at a certain point, and this point is called the equilibrium price. So basically, the equilibrium price is when both the demand and supply is equal together. Now let's have a look at market disequilibrium. Market disequilibrium simply means it when is occurred when the quantity demanded for a product is either higher or lower than the quantity supplied. This equilibrium is inefficient as it means there are either shortages or surpluses. When having a look at a shortage, this basically means when there is excess demand which will create this shortage in the market. As you can see in this diagram, there is excess demand leading to a shortage. Then there is also the surpluses. The surpluses is caused when there is an excess in supply. And you can see in the diagram, this shows an excess in supply. Let's have a look at the labor curve now. So the SL curve can be backward bending as you can see in this figure. 
This figure basically shows that high wages rates will cause the workers to work long hours to increase their earnings, but only up to a certain point. As the wage rates increase from W1 to W2, the number of hours worked increases from, w, from H1 to H2. However, as an increase from W2 to W3, the number of hours worked falls from H2 to H3 because there is a trade-off between work and leisure time. At W3, a person can work fewer hours yet have a higher income than at W2. The backward bending supply of the labor curve therefore occurs when the wage rates rise to a high enough point to allow people to work less and enjoy more leisure time. Hence, that's why it's a backward bending curve. Now let's have a look at price elasticity of demand. Basically, price elasticity of demand measures the degree of responsiveness of the quantity demanded of a product following a change in its price. If a price causes a relative ch small change in the quantity demanded, then demand is said to be price inelastic. So when we're having a look at price elasticity, we're simply just having a look at when I change the price, what is the response of the demand? We use several curves to show this. The first one is the price inelastic demand curve. The next one is the price elastic demand curve. We also have other special ones like the perfectly price inelastic demand curve the perfectly price elastic demand curve, and finally the unitary price elastic demand curve. We also have the price elasticity of supply, and they are similar curves to the price elasticity of demand. Here we have a price elastic supply curve, a price inelastic supply curve, a perfectly price inelastic supply curve, a perfectly price elastic curve, and finally a unitary price elastic curve. So there you go guys, those are all the diagrams you need to know for the IGCSE economics exam. They mainly ask you on the demand and supply curves as well as the PPC curves. So you should mainly focus on those curves. But the other curves are as important as these ones because you need to understand the concept with the help of diagrams. I hope you enjoyed this video. I'll see you in the next one.